Hello, and thank you for joining the first Summer Scholar Series event of this year. My name is Anya Kaplan, and I'm Head of Operations and Events for the Fashion Scholarship Fund. Before we dive in, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. As many of us at this point are very familiar with Zoom, there are some great features that we encourage you to use. One of them is the Q&A box. Feel free to send in your questions and we'll answer as many as possible during the Q&A segment of the discussion. And now I would like to introduce FSF's Senior Director of Education Programming, Marie Coletta. Thank you, Anya. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are pleased to present to you the very first workforce preparedness session for 2022 FSF Summer Scholar Series. Today, we'll take a hard look at design and product development. And I have a very interesting panel of speakers for you today. Let us begin with Jess Lomax. Jess is the Executive Vice President Global Head of Design at Calvin Klein, and Jess is also one of our newer FSF board members. Thank you, Jess, for attending. We also have Christine Wu, who is the Design Manager for Recovery Apparel at Under Armour. Christine is also a 2008 scholar and alumnus of Parsons School of Design. In addition, we have Blanche Mutunda, who is a 2020 FSF scholar and alumnus of Iowa State University. And last but not least, we have Zachary Ho, a 2010 scholar from Kent State University. Zach now teaches design at the University of Cincinnati. Zach is also one of our members of our Educator Advisory Board um, for the design case study. So before we get go any further, I'd like to turn it over to Jess and Christine, and perhaps you can give us a little bit of background about yourselves and your professional journey to where you got to today. So Jess, why don't we start with you? Perfect, thanks Marie, and hi everyone. Very happy to be here um, having this time together. So yeah, I could talk a little bit about myself. Um, as Marie mentioned, I'm the head of design at Calvin Klein. Um, and I've been in this role for about 18 months. Um, and I really started my career, I'm from the UK originally, and I really started my career in London. I worked for um, small fashion brands like Alexander McQueen and Hussein Shalayan, who um, is you know, not so prominent now, but back at that time was really quite renowned for being an innovator. And I think for me, I was always really inspired by innovation in design, as well as real purpose-driven design. Um, I really love to have like a real strong concept um, and something that really drives what the design is doing and how it can have an impact in the world. So um, at some point I decided to join Nike because I just felt like it really combined this purpose-driven and innovation together. So I was at Nike for about seven years and I was able to work in London, West Coast, also New York, and had a very varied experience, which was amazing and worked on some incredible projects like Olympics and the Women's Soccer World Cup, where we're really fighting for, mm -hmm. for gender equity in sport. Um, and yeah, I had an amazing experience there. Um, so I feel like all of that has really helped me grow into this role at Calvin Klein, which is really quite a diverse design experience, I would say, because there's underwear, apparel, but there's also accessories, footwear, jewelry, fragrance, um, a lot of different dimensions um, of designer and product development. So um, it's been really exciting 18 months. and. Um, as Marie mentioned, I just joined the FSF board a few months ago, so it's been um, really great and I'm very happy to be here and, and share any insights and experience with you today. And then with that, I'll pass over to Christine, shall I? Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Wu. Very excited to be here today to speak to everybody. Um, my passion journey began at Parsons, as Marie mentioned. Uh, I majored in menswear there and I was an FSF Jeffrey Bean Scholar in 2008, which was mm -hmm. an amazing experience. Um, after I graduated, I joined the design team at Converse, where I basically got a very solid foundation in the corporate fashion world. So learning to work on a seasonal schedule, building bombs and tech packs, you know, really working as part of a team for the first time. And eventually I took a break from my professional career to go back to school. 
actually I went back to school twice. The first time was because I wanted to learn more than what I could at work. You know, the more I designed, the more questions I had. I was very curious about why people wear what they wear, where trends come from, what clothing means for personal identity, for social identity. So I moved to the UK for a year to pursue a master's degree in social anthropology. And when I returned to New York, I felt that I was able to really apply all those things that I learned in my master's to my practical day-to-day -day work. And a couple of years later, I had the opportunity to do a second master's at Bunka Gakuen in Tokyo. So oh. I moved to, yes, <laughs> I moved to Japan for two years to study fashion theory. I did my thesis on traditional Japanese crafts, specifically indigo dyeing. Um, and it was an incredible, incredible experience. And I think that being in academia really allows you to focus on your interests um, and hone your research in a way that you might not necessarily be able to do while you're working full time. Mm -hmm. Following my second master's, I pivoted away from design. I joined a trend forecasting agency, um, again, because I wanted to put all those things I learned to use, you know, take all those like theoretical concepts and create practical methodologies out of them. And trend really was the perfect place to do that. Um, a short while later, I came across an opportunity at Adidas in Shanghai. I've always been interested in the APAC market, especially in China. So it was really a chance that I didn't want to miss out on. And I have to say, living in Shanghai was so eye-opening. The fashion there, the trends, the consumer mindset, it's just so different from anywhere else. And last September, I started my current role at Under Armour. I am the design manager over Recover Apparel. So Recover Apparel is essentially what our athlete wears when they're not actively working out. So when they're in recovery mode. So this means that our product is mainly athleisure driven. It's trend inspired, but it's still rooted in our sports DNA and it still maintains the material technology that makes Under Armour so special. So that's my journey in a nutshell. Very interesting. Chris, I didn't know all that about you. So yeah. thank you for that little introduction. Um, Zach, can you give us an introduction about your journey as well? Sure, sure. Um, my name is Zachary Ho. Uh, I, uh, my journey with FSF has kind of gone full circle in a very interesting way. Um, I'm a graduate of Kent State University from 2011 and a scholar from 2010 with FSF. Um, after graduation, I lived and worked in New York for a minute many years across very different kind of facets of industry in production design, product development for companies like J. Crew, um, Dury Chung, and Josie Natori. And after spending several years in industry, I decided that uh, going back to school, <laughs> much like Christine, was uh, yeah. an opportunity for me to broaden my skill set and uh, live in some of the spaces that I really resonated with in design in a way that wasn't so um, regimented like it can be in industry. Uh, so after completing my graduate degree at the University of Cincinnati, I fell into teaching, uh, and I've been here as an assistant professor for nearly five years at this point, uh, and I've also become the uh, educating partner for FSF for my institution as well. Great, great. Belange, can you give us a little introduction as well? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Thanks. My name is Belange Mutunda. I am an FSF scholar from 2020. And my journey in fashion was a little bit different from everybody because in high school, I graduated with a major in mathematics and physics. And most of my classes were uh, geared towards engineering. I wanted to become a chemical engineer like my father, but I discovered my passion for fashion my senior year of high school, actually like three months before I graduated. So I decided I was gonna go to fashion school, but I had no background in fashion, business or anything like that. I was just creative. So I moved to the U.S. in 2015 for a uh, fashion school. I started with merchandising because I was really good at making like hands craft, but I really needed to start with business, like the business side of fashion. So I did my associate degree in uh, uh, fashion design and merchandising. I took some interior design classes and then I also did general studies. And then after that, I wanted to work, uh, just take a break between my associate and undergrad but I just wanted to learn more technical skills. So I just took like one semester break, like a summer. And then I went to Iowa State. That's where I got to know about the FSF. Actually, I found out about FSF in 2018, but I wasn't ready to do the case study back then. I just felt like I wasn't a right fit back then. So I took my classes and then in 2019, 
I had a lot of projects I was working on, working on like business startup competitions. I was doing a lot, like I was really busy the summer of 2019. And my advisor back then used to tell me about the FSM. I was like, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then in October, like four days before the deadline of the, the case study, <laughs> She emailed me again. She's like, I think you should do this thing. So I was like, okay. So I literally did my case study four days before, which I would not recommend. <laughs> and the thing that helped me was because my idea, the concept that I had, I didn't find it four days before the case study. That's a project I was working on a long time before the case study. And it was for a different project that didn't work out. So I already had like a big concept about what I wanted to do. I had my Pinterest board from 2017. So everything was already together and I just needed to write it up. So I literally submitted my case study, I think maybe like 30 minutes before. <laughs> the so that was my experience. And I was glad that I did it because I worked under pressure and I didn't realize I developed strong market research skills in four days. And then after that, it's been really easy for me to work on big projects. And then after that, I've been involved with the FSS, you know, ever since then. And it's really like, it's been a really big blessing for me because right now we're working on a, another project. I don't know if I can disclose it right you, now. You, you yeah. can. <laughs> <laughs> so like Marie reached out to me, I think two months ago about like an opportunity to uh, have my scale my business and work in partnership with Excel Brands and have my design uh, manufactured, mass produced and sold on QVC and HSN. So this is something I'm working on right now with the FSS. And if I didn't do the case study back then, I wouldn't have this opportunity, honestly. And I feel like uh, if I wasn't a part of the FSF, I wouldn't get this opportunity on my own. So I'm really grateful for that. So besides being a student, like I said, I'm a designer. I have a clothing brand. I started my brand, you know, again in high school when I was 17 and that's what I do. I specialize in Afrocentric fashion. I do a lot of custom clothes. I've done collaboration with a few celebrities here and there. So that's something I'm really proud of. And then I also love teaching. When I was a student in Iowa State, I was a teaching assistant in the uh, pattern making classes. So we did the traditional pattern drafting and then the CAD pattern making class. Then in 2020, when COVID hit, when we shut down, I was able to introduce 3D design in our design major. So I introduced Glow 3D at Iowa State. So that was something I was really proud of. Like me leaving Iowa State, I was happy that I was I was able to leave that big legacy there. So that's a little bit about me as a student and a designer, and that's my journey in fashion. Well, good. I definitely learned a little bit more about you through your introduction, so that's all good. Um, I do have a few questions before we jump into the case study. I think our viewers might like to learn a little bit more about the design role, both at Calvin Klein and Under Armour. So just can you give us a little information on this? I know you're way above that entry-level design position, but I'm sure you can share some insights. Yeah, and I work very closely with all the designers. So at whatever <laughs> level, um, it's been really nice to be able to meet everyone because there's a team of maybe 100. So there's a huge, incredible um, group of talented designers. And a big part of what I've been doing is bringing a lot of different teams together um, because before they were all quite separate. But really my mission is to bring everyone together as collaboration. And hmm. Okay, so oh, Jess is back. Let's give her a second to reconnect, guys. All good. We can carry on, right? Yes, yes. Go ahead, Jess. We can hear you. Perfect. Um, but yeah, I think um, the designers, it, it can be quite varied based on the sin season, right, where you are in the season. But I think a big part of um, Calvin Klein design is really being able to take inspiration from the amazing history of the brand. And we have the most phenomenal archive. Everyone who visits it just you know, loses their mind is so amazing. Um, Calvin himself is actually a hoarder. So he kept everything since the beginning of the brand. Um, and there's this amazing facility which has every runway show ever, chronological, chronological order of all the looks, 50,000 garments, it's really amazing. So it's really taking inspiration from that and this amazing history of the brand about innovation and recontextualizing everyday products. Um, and then really bringing a fresh perspective and kind of a future vision to that. So a lot of the designers are spending a lot of time really getting inspired, researching, because um, obviously it's been a tough few years in terms of like getting out and being able to travel. So really looking for new ways to get inspiration, whether it's like meeting different people around the city, going to art galleries, going to the archive and really forming these very strong concepts 
um, and then really taking those concepts all the way through to the customer and designing product that really um, is based on something that we stand for as a brand that harkens back to the heritage, but also looks to the future. So I would say this point of Calvin Klein, the design roles are very creative and inspirational and really trying to reset the vision for the brand. Terrific. Chris, can you tell us a little bit about the design role at Under Armour? Absolutely. I think being a, being a designer at Under Armour, really any sports brand right now is very exciting because of the impact of sportswear, of sneaker culture, uh, and all of these things on pop culture and on streetwear right now. And what is unique about Under Armour is that we're very much rooted in sports. Our core consumer, we call our um, core performer. So it's our athlete. And we really care about what our clothes can do for our athletes. So how to make things the most functional, the most comfortable, you know, what sort of technology we can inject into the fabric, you know, at a material level, you know, into our trims, and also how we can be sustainable. So a lot of the things that we try to do now is to incorporate elements of sustainability, whether it's in the actual materials or in our processes as well. So especially accelerated by the pandemic and everyone working remotely, a lot of the fittings we do are completely virtual. So they're actually garments mocked up in these 3D CADs and you save the step of having to get protos made in a factory, often mm -hmm. which, you know, get tossed aside once you're done with it and they get burned. So having these 3D models is such a big step in sustainability and kind of saving our materials. So I think, you know, we're at a very interesting point in fashion and sports right now where we have access to all this technology, which makes it very exciting. And I'd say, mm -hmm. No, 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 I was just going to say, I agree with you, Chris. I mean, at this point, technology has so worked in our favor, especially over the past few years, but to see it working in design as well with samples, that's very exciting. Absolutely. And I think beyond that, you know, what I like to tell my designers when we think about the work we do every season is to create clothes that the consumer wants to wear, essentially. So for us designers, this means constantly keeping an eye out on what's happening in fashion, in pop culture, in the consumer space, as well as understanding who our core consumer is and what our brand identity is. So when those seasonal briefs come through, you're ready to go. Terrific. So I'd like to ask you each one more question. So for someone who's just starting out in design, what are you, what are couple of characteristics or skills that you look for as hiring managers for entry-level designers. So Jess, can you share anything with us? Yeah, I think um, number one is really passion and drive. I think people who really are really motivated, really um, want to be part of something that you're doing, people who really want to be part of where the brand is going and what it's standing for. Um, I think is the number one thing. You just want people who want to be there and who want to be part of it. Um, I think the other really big thing is collaboration. Um, I think that's a huge thing for anyone who's a designer because um, even if you work in a tiny business, um, you're still working with lots of different people, whether it's like someone in the manufacturer, you know, it's, it's such a collaborative industry. There are so many people who like pull this together. Um, and so I think, yeah, whether it's small or big business, collaboration is really key. And I think um, something that I always look for in a designer is like compassion and empathy, because I think that is really key to making collaboration like extremely successful. Um, and then also I would say purpose driven. Anyone who really has like a bigger purpose and wanting to design for impact, um, you know, Chris, you're talking about amazing things that we're doing in 3D and sustainability in the industry. You know, there's a lot of things that do need to shift in this industry in terms of sustainability, inclusion. You know, there's a lot of things that we're all working on at the moment. And I think mm -hmm. there's huge opportunity as creatives. It opens up like so many possibilities, which is really exciting. So I think anyone who shows an interest in anything to do with that aspect of the industry in terms of technology, sustainability, I think is really, really important. Great, thank you. Chris. Can you add anything to that? I think everything Jess said is super <laughs> and very crucial when we look at candidates. Um, I do think a lot of skills can be trained. So when Good I look time. at candidates, you know, I look for people who show a potential to learn and grow, people who are curious and who are open-minded. 
Um, and as for hard skills, you know, there are basic requirements for every different level, different, you know, programs you need to be proficient in. Um, but beyond that, and we talked about this a little bit, Marie, is that I actually like to look for candidates who can draw because I love a good portfolio and, you know, everything is just so digitized now. Like everything we do is an illustrator. So it's actually quite rare um, in my experience to find designers who are able to draw by hand. And yeah. I think that just adds such a great element to the work. It, it is. So for those of you that don't know, years ago, I did recruitment. Um, I did executive search and it was, I actually remember when I met with Zach, when you won your scholarship that year and you came to meet with me and you showed me your portfolio. This, the illustrations that Zach had in his portfolio back then were magnificent. And it, I just enjoyed flipping those pages and looking at his illustrations. So I agree with you. I'm a softie for hand sketches, but obviously in today's world, you know, it's important to have the technical side and, and no cat as well. So with that being said, I'd like to just touch very quickly with, with Zach and Belange about your personal experience with the FSF and, you know, how you, what, how you grew with us through some of the things that you um, we we had for you during the time. And Zach, I know we're going back a few years, so we may not have had all the programs that we have today. But can you share anything with us? Sure. Um, FSF was a, a great opportunity for me. Um, and kind of before everyone joined, we were kind of getting to know each other a little bit. And, and I had a bit of a, a similar experience as a student being a little bit apprehensive. Um, and I wish I wouldn't have been so afraid or or nervous to kind of jump in and do it. Um, I have a very fond memory of my FSF journey way back when in 2009 and 10 when I was doing it. Um, I was studying abroad at the time and I was in Italy. So I completed my case study overseas and it meant that I had to reinterpret the brief to a degree. Uh, one of the requirements for my year was to go to a physical store and there weren't any Macy's in uh, Europe. So I had to kind of find another route uh, and the lesson for me that I kind of continue to pass on to my students, whether Marie agrees with this or not, I'm not sure, um, is to be okay with interpreting the brief in a way that makes sense to you and that really plays to the strengths and the abilities that you have in that moment when you're completing the case study. Um, so for me, it was a really phenomenal experience and it's grown into such a wonderful partnership and kind of new life for me as an educator now on the other side of things uh, and to support my students as they move forward through this has been incredible. Uh, so I'm really grateful for the, the kind of full circle experience that I've had with FSF and it's such a huge badge of honor that I wear um, in so many different capacities. So I can't like say much, or, you know, I can't say enough about <laughs> how fantastic it's been for me. So, and it's just so rewarding to see this on the other side for my students as they. Yeah, so and, it, and I have to say, it is just so rewarding for us personally to work with our alums in the positions that they're in now, both Zach and Chris. And um, we're, we're very fortunate to have them as engaged with our organizations as they are. Belange, can you maybe just touch upon something quickly that was your FSF experience? And maybe um, there was some mentoring or any of the opportunities that we have shared with you over the past year? Of course. So I'll start with something maybe just like pretty basic. Through the case study, I was able to make friends. Uh, I'm a really like I'm an introvert and really shy person. But when I went to the gala, I met so many people, so many people. I met a lot of friends there. And then I was able to connect, like just network. We had a lot of networking opportunities. I was able to network. And there are so many opportunities like internships. I didn't get to do an internship because I had a really heavy course load. I was like really wanting to like finish my degree. So I didn't get to do an internship, but there are so many companies that were there. And I know a lot of people that did get internships. So that's a, like a really good thing. It was a really nice opportunity to just get, um, you don't really get a lot of um, like opportunities like this when you're outside of, you know, like uh, something like the FSF. And it was a really nice uh, opportunity for me and then just growing like business wise, it's been a lot. Last year when I when I applied for the accelerator grant, again, like this was again my first time that I did like a really, really extensive business plan. I've been having like I had a business, I had a business, but it's just like when I started, 
it was just like uh, it was more like a hobby so i didn't specifically have a business plan or if i had it it wasn't really extensive so when i did the accelerator grant it was really nice for me to just learn all this stuff and then the mentorship that i had um and now working again with the fsf to like you know grow my brand so it's been really really nice to be a part of this so yeah terrific and we love having you as all part of our organization thank you so much so i think we'll turn over to anya now uh, maybe you can share your screen and we can dive into the case study terrific so as we know we're going to focus on the design and product development case today and I think we can go to the next slide, right, Anya? I so Zach, is this your slide? Jump in. Okay, I wasn't sure if there was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's like fine. Or not. Okay. Take it away, um, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> this, this first slide speaks to the broad objective of the case study, um, and really, what the case is asking you to do. Uh, is to, to put yourself between uh, a well-established, robust understanding of an existing fashion brand and the contemporary kind of need through your research of what consumers are after, you know, in this market or maybe even beyond in the future. Uh, and kind of situated between these two mm, kind of components of the case study is your opportunity as the creative director to breathe some new life into your chosen brand by leveraging your expertise you know, built through research of what's happening from a consumer needs perspective, but what also makes sense for the brand at hand. Got it. I don't know if that was enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Up here. <laughs> so move on. Um, and then kind of what's, what's really important here, I think, and this is maybe the advice that I would give to my students is read the brief and then read it again, and then wait two days and read the brief a third time. Uh, and digest it, understand what it's asking for you to do. Uh, and part of part of what's happening here is that, um, at least on this slide, is that the brief is asking you to identify some purchase drivers, which are going to be researched uh, items, not items isn't the right word, um, opportunities that consumers are looking at that might help them uh, associate with the brand connect with the brand, obviously leading to a purchase uh, in some instances. So some of the examples that are on the screen here, I think are pretty great in terms of sustainability, a sense of community, uh, social justice that a brand might associate itself with, et cetera, that are all kind of appealing to consumers in a very contemporary capacity, right? Terrific. Uh, next slide, yep. Jessica, do you wanna go first or should I? Um, you go first, Valange. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> this was actually a very exciting board for me to do. Like this was the most exciting part for me. Um, I started from Pinterest, and the Vogue runway app. That's where I get all my ideas. So I would recommend you just have like, you have start really early. First of all, start early. So you can put like all your broad ideas together. And then after that, you can narrow down everything. So you just start with like rough ideas. Um, like uh, Christine said, there are so many rare people who do hand illustration now, but for me, I love doing hand illustration. So everything for me for my first case study was done by hand. So all my sketches were done by hand. So just do all like your research, put everything on a Pinterest board, have like a masterpiece, like Pinterest board and then put your pins, organize everything and then narrow down your ideas. So that's pretty much what I can say about this part here. It's just like your rough ideas. Yeah, I think that's great. I think it's so good to compile it all really early on, right? Um, and the other thing I would just add, um, I love what you said, Belange, about how when you did this case study, you already had the concept. You've been thinking about it for so long. And I think the concept for me is like the most important part because once you have the concept and the story that you wanna tell, everything else falls into line. And if you don't have that up front, it can be really difficult, the entire creative process. And that's something I've really learned in the last few roles I've been in is, if you have a strong concept from the beginning, everyone you work with, everyone you connect with, how you share it out, it just, it becomes really obvious what you're trying to say as a designer. Um, and it's actually the first thing I did at Calvin Klein was set up a concept team because we didn't have one. And I think it's like, <laughs> for me, the most important part. And it's really like, for me, this is like the purpose of your project, like the insight, the inspiration, who is like, who are you designing for? How do you want it to show up? 
Um, so yeah, I love that you were saying, Belange, just like gather all the different things and really compile it together. And I would really spend time on this part because it will really help all the other steps in the process. Um, and I think it can be words as well as images, because I think sometimes it's like great to explain your mission or your purpose from this project through words too. So I think sometimes you can't always find that perfect image. Um, that would just be my tip. Like you can also use words to explain an idea. Great. And I just want to jump into Jess's point about starting early. Our case studies were released in February. And the reason being is that it takes time to come up with your concept, whether it be the design case study or any of the other three. So we really do encourage you to take the time early on to really think through this process and to work on your inspiration board, obviously, for design, because it as Jess said, it takes time. Let's go to the next slide, Anya. So I think this one is for Belange and Christine. Belange, would you like to start? I'll let you start this time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, building on what Jess said, I would agree that concept is the most important. Um, and these slides, you know, your materials board, your color palette, this is the part that really brings that concept to life. So this is also very critical in your presentation. You want to make sure that everything is aligned to the story that you're telling. Um, I also see some branding on this page. So I would add, you know, graphics, branding, like those are the things that show who you are as a brand. So you want all of that to be very cohesive as well, again, to support your storytelling, to support your overall concept. I think Kristen said anything. I don't know what else to add. She mentioned everything. All right. Ani, can you give us slide six? Thank you. Belange, is there anything you can add here about technical flats? Yeah, so this one would be, so I did the design and product development case study. So I'll speak uh, to the design and product development uh, applicants. So for the tech flat, if you don't know what a tech flat is, it's just like the garments that you have, like you have like what I'm wearing right now, just lay it flat on the ground and then imagine it how it would be on paper. Like it is like the black and white, the tech flat doesn't have colors. So you just like it's flat. So put all the details. So if you have a jacket that has a button, put the button in the zipper, put it like put all the details that you can put the stitches, if the stitches are gonna be visible, put all the stitches, put the darts, like pretty much everything. And if you need help, my my inbox is always open. Uh, you can reach, re reach out to me by email, I'll help you, I'll walk you through. And I do my tech flats by hand and by computer. So my first case study, I did it by hand, I'm faster by hand. And then the second time I did it on the computer. So if you need help, you have any question about a tech flat, you can reach out to me, I'm always happy to help if I'm available, but yeah. <laughs> um, Belange, I see lots of LinkedIn messages to you about this coming your way, so be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so we free actually from um, end of August all the way to <laughs> October something. So I'll be free in September. So reach out to me if you need help. That's very kind of you, yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right, Anya, next slide. Um, I believe Zach and Jess, you guys can comment on this one, right? Yeah. Do you want me to kick it off, Zach? Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to kick this off because this is actually a lot of what I'm doing in my current role. It's really like, how do you take those design concepts and really like communicate that story out? And how do you connect like all together as a group across marketing, store design, um, whether it's like visual merchandising, it's really about how do you get your idea out there is super important, I think. Um, and for me, like if this is helpful, I always think about like how does the brand connect to the consumer, to the product, to the experience, and make sure that there's like a cohesive kind of um, aesthetic across all of those things. Um, and really just think about like, who are you speaking to? Like, who are you wanting to wear your product at the end of the day? And then where are they and how is it like best to connect with them? Um, it's kind of a helpful way, I think, to approach it. But I think more and more designers are kind of leaning into this idea of how do you communicate your story? And I have to say, when I was at Nike, I really learned this. Like some of the most successful designers were the ones who knew how to communicate their ideas. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a really helpful skill to like practice and learn, I think. 
Um, and also there's just so many tools available to us as designers and product developers that can really like push your ideas, which is amazing. And I think here it's great to think about how you can do digital activations as well as physical and how do those two worlds connect? Because it's kind of a relatively new space and it's been around for a few years, but how do you really connect like a store experience with an online experience and a social, like really think about like how you can use your creativity as a designer to think about how you want your product to be experienced. Great. I hope everyone took a lot of notes there because I find <laughs> from an educator's perspective, this is a very challenging part for design students, especially those who are in the, the lower levels. Um, this is a different way of thinking. It's a little bit of a stretch for some. It's not the design that you might come to know and be comfortable with in this academic setting. Uh, so it's a critical piece of the puzzle. And I think everything that Jess said is, is excellent advice. Terrific. Thank you. All right, so we're on to tech packs. Um, Zach, I think you can comment on this and then sure. follow maybe Christine can add a little bit more. So this is a new element, I believe, uh, for the case study this year. So I think what this boils down to is understanding that you have the technical still skills to communicate your design ideas uh, in a real physical space. Uh, attention to detail will be critical here. Understanding specs, uh, how to write uh, and communicate in a technical language quite plainly and effectively uh, here. The template that's provided, I think, is useful, um, but it contains quite a bit of information. So you're going to have to really understand the translation of your design idea as a concept, as a drawing, uh, into something a little bit more three-dimensional and uh, tangible. Great point, Zach. I would also add, you know, that tech packs are definitely not the most exciting part of anybody's <laughs> job in fashion, but it's very important. Um, we call them bombs, bill of material. So essentially you list out every component of your garment um, for it the factory to produce what you designed. Um, and a lot of things, you know, you might not necessarily see on the sketch, which is why it's so important to call that out. And then you can identify what colors you want things to be in, um, what size your trims are supposed to be. So, you know, while it gets very granular, um, it's definitely a very important component and it shows that you are thinking through every aspect of your design. Yeah, I just wanna add one quick thing here. So first of all, there is a template for a tech pack um, that we have shared with our educator advisors on this. So if you need it, please feel free to reach out to the educator who uh, works with our competition at your campus. And then as we go through the development of the case study, there are elements that are built in here that are very important for entry level designers to know. So we're not pulling things that we're not asking you to do uh, specific exercises that someone who's been in design for five years would do. I think Jess and Chris, you can probably, and even Zach, when you were working in the industry, you all can agree that these are very entry level requirements for a new designer coming into a company. They need to know these skills. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, this is one of the first things you'll learn um, and you'll have to work on in, in a company for sure. Great. I, I, I agree. I would also agree with what Chris said earlier, though, is like you can teach a lot of these skills. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I still think the most important thing is being open and curious to try it because you can learn some of this on the job. But I think if you've done it before, it really helps because it's definitely a big part of uh, entry level designer. Terrific. So we know that this is not the most exciting thing that you'll do in your case study if you decide to do the design and product development case, but it is so important and you'll need these skills when you get into your first job. Next slide, Anya. Okay, so getting back to what I was just saying, 
in the case study, we do have a resource list. So if some of you are not sure about how to do a tech pack or where to look for some um, resources that have to do about this particular topic, we do provide a resource list specifically for design. Um, and that is in our Dropbox. And you can get the link to that from your educator at your school who once again is overseeing our competition. We also will be sending out interesting articles that Katie and I and any of our um, members here, if you, there's something that you're reading in your inbox that you think is relevant to the design case study, we're happy to share that with our applicants from now all the way up to the time of submission, which as we know, that's October. So that is on to the next one, Anya. All right, so I've been looking at the chat box and we actually have some really interesting questions that I'd like to share with some of our panelists. So um, there is one student that has asked about how difficult it is, is it to navigate the corporate fashion structure? Um, is it a little bit, does it hold you back a little bit or is there still lots of create creativity within within the corporate structure. So maybe Jess, can you share some insights there? Yeah, I can definitely speak to that because I worked for very small like runway brands in Europe before and now I work in big like corporate companies in the US. So I've definitely like experienced both sides. Um, I think that it, it completely depends on the company and like the brand vision and purpose of whichever company you're working for. But I find that it's, um, more empowering in these big structures for creativity than less. Like I don't find it so restrictive. I just find often there's more people who wanna support the vision. There's more um, sort of opportunities to do different things. Um, and that's what I really enjoy about it. Like at Nike, for example, I did so many different roles and so many different projects that if I was in a small brand, I wouldn't be able to. And I was able to push my creativity like so much more than I ever had before. So. I think in some regards, there's a commercial aspect to it. Um, and you do need to be, uh, you need to understand your consumer, where they're shopping, what they want. I loved what Chris said earlier about designing things that people want to wear. It's very important in a commercial corporate setting, but my experience has been that the, it actually um, kind of creates more opportunity for creativity rather than less. Terrific. Chris, is there anything that you'd like to add here? I would also agree with Jess. I think, you know, working in a structured corporate setting gives you a lot of freedom um, because you aren't designing your own brand. So you work within an existing structure, which is very nice. Um, and it makes you kind of consider, you know, who that consumer is that you're designing for. Um, with big line plans, there's always times where you get styles that aren't as exciting. You know, some things just have to be done. So we get like a lot of sweatshirts and sweatpants and you know very standard colors and sometimes there's just like carryover styles um, so it's not like every single SKU is some like brand new exciting piece um, and that's just part of the business and part of you know what it's like to work at a corporate fashion company um, to be totally honest um, but I do think that you know within that there is still a lot of room to explore a lot of room for creativity and you get the added bonus of, you know, being in an established company that has a very nice schedule um, that has a milestone calendar. So you don't have, you know, little surprises and like rush deadlines and things. So I would say the work-life balance is also a lot better in big companies. Terrific. Um, there's some questions about programs that are important to know and maybe when you were in school or are there specific programs that you look for entry-level designers coming into your organizations that they really should have a very good understanding of and specifically some are asking as it relates to 3D. I can say um, at Under Armour and all the other places I've worked, we use Illustrator the most. So being able to sketch all your plots in Illustrator is very important. Um, we use Clo for 3D, um, yeah. but that is something that the company will provide, that kind of training. So every company you know, might use a different 3D program. Um, depending on the team you're on, you might not need to learn 3D. So it also depends um, what role you end up in, um, but the training is completely provided by the company.
Okay, another question that we have some from one of our viewers is the process, the design process, and how do you refine a collection and decide what works within that collection and perhaps maybe how you edit it down? Jess, can you share some thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, we start everything um, in the last few places I've worked, it really starts with design, like we're the beginning of the process, right? We do a lot of the like ideation, inspiration, the concepting. Um, we're very fortunate at Calvin Klein because we have a huge atelier. So we make everything in-house first. So we can really make the entire collection to see how it comes to life. We have incredible pattern cutters and denim experts. So it really helps us kind of create the vision. Uh, we also use 3D a lot. So in some certain collections, we'll create the whole collection in 3D first. We have a 3D atelier, which is really more about concepting future ideas in 3D rather than recreating just physical samples. Um, but yeah, in terms of like how we build the line and edit, we work really closely with our merchandising partners. Um, and I think there's like always in these, um, when you're designing a collection in a bigger company, there's this like healthy kind of tension between design really wanting to push and merchandising really trying to create something that the market needs. And I always say like the merchandisers are hindsighting um, on what's working, what's done well before, and as much hindsighting as they do, design needs to balance it out with the foresighting of where we think the future is, what the trends are, where the customer's going, where culture is shifting to. So I would say we edit the line together and it's always really a, a compromise of creating the vision that we want to and also covering the commercial needs. Um, so I would say it's highly collaborative and that's why I talk a lot about collaboration because I think that's how, for me and my experience how you create the best line and the best collection is really collaborating with all the different points of view around the table. Terrific. Some of the questions also have come in about sustainability. And obviously it's the hot topic today and there are still some challenges around it. So um, Chris or Jess, if you can share your thoughts about how your organizations are dealing with sustainability today within design. Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, we are definitely looking into using a lot of sustainable, a lot of recycled materials and trims. Um, so, but, you know, thinking beyond just the design process, thinking into, you know, how we work, you know, doing Zoom calls, for example, you know, not having to be in the office and, you know, open all those lights and, um, you know, and commute. Yeah, it's like all these little steps count, you know, building things in 3D, doing virtual fittings instead of physical fittings, um, and then really just embracing the technology around that, I think, is what's helping us, you know, become more sustainable and embrace sustainability. Um, and beyond that, you know, a lot of things are sort of beyond our control, you know, we are producing more garments, more clothes into the world. Um, so we want to make sure that we design with purpose and with intent for everything that we do. You know, we want to make sure that the things we make is important and is needed um, and is, you know, something that helps our consumer. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the purpose is so important that you're not just creating stuff to put out there, that there really is like you're creating it for someone who's really going to want to wear it. Um, and I think yeah, I love that you're talking about purpose and intention, Chris, because I think that is really an important step. And sustainability is something that should be like absolute priority for everyone on this call, right? This industry needs to figure out how we become more sustainable. So I think any ideas that you can create around this is only going to benefit you and your career and the industry and the planet ultimately. So it's, it's an interesting um, time to be a designer, I think, because as creatives, I think we crave um, problem solving, like that's what we do, right? As designers, I think often mm -hmm. we love to create creative solutions to an insight or a, a problem. And we actually call them opportunities, not problems or challenges, because it just opens up so much for creatives and like creates so many exciting um, kind of things to dig into. Like one thing is like, how do you create product that can last longer? How do you reinforce? How do you think about longevity? that it could be continued to be recycled and like go through all the first store process. One thing could be around completely circular design and how do you like connect with all your different teammates and different functions and make sure that like, the box is being shipped in is considered, you know, the entire process. There's also regenerative, like we're doing a lot at Calvin where 
we're working with regenerative cottons. We're setting up cotton farms to replace the plants. So there's just so many opportunities. I think it's an exciting time to be a designer. It sounds super exciting from that perspective. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, one of our viewers have actually asked a question, Chris, that is specifically for you. They'd like to learn a little bit more about trend forecasting. So if you can give us a little bit more on that, um, that would be great. Trend forecasting is so much fun, honestly, um, <laughs> as a career, but also, you know, even as an apparel designer, it's something that you, you use and something that you need to know. So basically what trend forecasting is, is, you know, you predict trends in the future. It's usually one to two years ahead, um, sometimes three. And what I like to do when I look at forecasting is to draw a lot from my anthropology experience. So really looking at culture because, and I tell my designers this, everything is connected. So what's happening in the world, in news and politics, um, in technology, everything is connected to fashion, even if it feels like it's not. So I always encourage my designers to keep an eye out, just be aware, you know, look at everything that's going on. And then you can start to distill the things that are important and that will certainly that you see will impact fashion, um, that you see will impact the way that consumers live, the way they think, the way they behave. And that can tell you, you know, what people are likely going to want to wear, what people might want to buy. Um, for example, you know, with this pandemic happening, we see that people are looking for clothing that is more protective, you know, clothing that is comfortable, um, clothing that is more flexible. And we can predict this kind of hybrid lifestyle will continue for a couple of seasons. Um, so, you know, with forecasting, it's really about just being a sponge and just absorbing everything you see. Um, and then, you know, starting to analyze those things. Sounds great. We have a question that I'm going to pose to all of you. Um, one of our scholars or applicants, I should say, has a question about what are important things to know as, um, as they start their summer internship? How can they be the best intern in a company? So can each of you give us one quick quality, that would be great. Well, I can start, I suppose. Um, pay attention and be present in that experience. There is so much going on around you beyond your department, and there is an insane amount of information you can learn, you can learn through observation uh, and by being present in that moment. So while some of the tasks may feel menial, depending on the, the opportunity at hand, um, if you look beyond those, there's a ton that you can take away from that experience. Jess, can you add yeah. something? Thanks. Yeah, I agree, Zach. I think um, being a sponge is really just a great way to go in and just think you want to absorb as much as possible. Um, and I think also just remaining like curious and open-minded because you never know what the experience could bring or where you can find insights and learning. So just go in with a really open and curious mindset. Great. I would add also, you know, set your ego aside. I, I remember when I was a student, when I graduated, I thought I knew everything. And when I entered a company, you know, for the first time, it was very humbling because there was just so much that was new to me. Um, so definitely, you know, put your ego aside. And like Zach and Jess said, be open-minded, pay attention, be curious. Um, and, you know, that's how you get the most out of the internship. Terrific. You know, I think all of those tips that you just heard not only apply to internships, but they also apply to your first job if you're graduating from school. So keep those things in mind. I think we're going to wrap up with the question that I love the most about this series, and I'm going to put it out to each of you. So Jess and Christine and Zach, knowing what you know today in your jobs and your experience, what is the best advice you could have told your younger self when you were in school? Who would like to go, go first? I can go, first. <laughs> go ahead. Um, <laughs> but I would have told myself to enjoy it, really enjoy every minute of it. We work in such an amazing, exciting industry and we get to do something so creative. Um, 
I think a lot of us creators are innovators and we want to keep pushing forward and onto the next. And as soon as the collection's done, you want to move on to the next and you'll have all these ideas. And I, I would say like, I would advise myself just pause, be present, be in the moment and just enjoy this amazing journey. Great. Thanks, Jess. Chris? Oh, I think I would tell myself to just trust my instincts um, mm -hmm. because throughout your career, you know, you'll run into a lot of moments of insecurity, of self-doubt. Uh, for example, you know, when I decided to switch careers and go into forecasting or when I decided to move abroad, a lot of people would question that and, you know, say, if you leave New York, if you leave the industry, it's going to be really hard to come back. Um, but at the end of the day, I think you have to do what feels right for you and you have to listen to that little voice in your head. Um, and all of the experiences that you have add up and make you who you are today. So I would say, you know, don't be afraid to go off the beaten path. Even if everyone else is doing something different, don't be afraid to carve your own journey and really trust your instincts. Love that. Thanks, Chris. Zach, can you share anything? Sure. I agree with Chris, uh, entirely. Um, I had a, a very specific vision that I saw myself moving in when I left undergrad. Um, and I had an opportunity to take a job that did not fit that vision uh, in production, where I never really you know, saw an opportunity. And it was phenomenal. Um, I built my network. I ran around New York like a maniac, producing samples in the garment district. And I loved every minute of it. And had I not kind of put that thought aside of what I thought, what a designer meant or what I wanted to do in the industry, I wouldn't have had that experience. Uh, and it was phenomenal. Um, and I, I work for Dury, which is a brand that's long gone at this point. But I often wonder if we had not closed, unfortunately, if I would still be there today because it was that uh, impactful on the experience and what let you know led to the the next jobs beyond that and now sitting here in Ohio of all places but uh, you know as an educator it, it it all kind of contributed to that so be open for sure terrific Belange we're going to end with you what advice can you give our applicants that are watching us today about this design case study I think for me I would say put fear aside <laughs> I'm speaking from like an immigrant standpoint I left my country. I was 19. I moved here and I was really passionate about what I was doing, but I got here. I barely spoke English. English is my fourth language. So it's like, I was really, really like, I started doubting myself. Like, did I make the right decision? Maybe I should have gone to engineering and just do that. Cause sometimes you like, uh, you face challenges and you start like doubting your decision. I was like, at some point I was like, maybe this is not what I was supposed to do. I should close down my business and just go to engineering school and just work somewhere. That's what I thought. <laughs> like at some point in 2018, I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna close down everything and just go back to what I was supposed to do. But I think just like that fear went away when I started just going out, networking, meeting people, and even just seeking mentorship. It was really, really nice, uh, like nice thing for me. So I would say just put that fear aside, trust your guts, you know, you made a decision and as an adult, it's just like whatever comes your way, it was your decision that you made. So you just accept everything that comes your way and don't feel like you don't belong. Because when I didn't do the case study in 2018, I felt really bad. I felt like it wasn't for me, but I didn't know what would have happened if I did it back then. It worked out in 2019, but maybe I should have done it a little bit earlier and be a part of the SSF a little bit earlier too. So put that fear aside, trust your gut, and you know just respect your decision and follow your dreams. So. Yeah. Thanks, Blanche. Thanks mm -hmm. so much. And thank you to all of our panelists. It was lovely speaking with you. You all had such great advice for our viewers. Um, Anya, do, did I cover everything I was supposed to? I think I did, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's one more thing I have to it, cover. And we hope that everyone here today watching enjoyed hearing um, the best advice from our panelists and learning about the case study. Don't be afraid of it. Just give yourselves enough time to prepare and work on it. Um, and be curious, as Jess said, so really dig into some things and have a passion. It was great tips. 
We hope that everyone here will tune in on June 14th for our sustainability session, which I know there's lots of questions. There were so many questions in the chat box, guys. There, I couldn't get to all, all of them. So we will try to address as many as we can with you. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to info at Fashion Scholarship Fund, and we'll answer every question that comes our way. So we wish all of our applicants the very best. Um, those that are in school that are starting internships this week, you're going to kill it. And our scholar, our alumni, we love seeing you here at these events. So thank you, everyone. You are fabulous. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.